everything has already happened. The flame is already fading, the night has already begun, the lords have already abandoned their thrones, and the Elden Ring has already been shattered. No matter which one of the feigned soulsborns we pick, upon our arrival in the world, such is its state. Stalemate and a stagnation, as if history itself has come to a halt, refusing to acknowledge any of the things that happen as we play, for they are seemingly too insignificant to be remembered by it. Indeed, despite the immense richness that the worlds we play possess in names that made history, names that we will certainly remember, no one in the history of those worlds seemed to remember that of ours, or any of the fellow undead Ashen Ones, Hunters or Tarnished that we might stumble upon for that matter. It's as if we are but visitors, wandering in a museum where time has frozen, a graveyard where all of history is seemingly present at once, but only in the form of decaying runes and tombstones. And this is how Elden Ring most truly resembles our age. Of course, when it comes to medieval fantasies, attempts at resembling real ideas, attitudes, figures or institutions alongside their relations and conflicts is nothing new, and although Soulsborns have always been brimming with rich histories that, despite being fictitious, are seemingly driven by real conflicts, they are hardly the only works that do so. However, what truly allows Soulsborns to resemble our contemporary life better than any of their contemporary works is the way they present their histories to us, an element entirely dependent upon the contemporariness of their medium, thanks to which merely depicting a certain fictional history or the story of certain characters witnessing it is no more the only way to present that history. In Soulsborns, we do not meet hallowed gods, but at best discover their hallowed corpses. Neither can we interact with any institutions except through their decaying runes. We rarely witness any historical events in these games, but might at best discover their marks given that we put in the effort. Soulsborns do not provide us the experience of living within and through history, but that of living after it. In this sense, among all Soulsborns, it is Elden Ring that best provides us that experience, largely thanks to its greater emphasis on limitless exploration, an element which perfectly complements the aesthetic of Rune through introducing to the image the figure of the Romantic Wanderer, a wanderer who is as affected by history as he is alienated from it, who although might choose to piece it together, can also completely ignore it and even if he does decide to trace it, he will be at best stumbling upon remainders of now decaying cathedrals or castles that merely signify a long lost glamour. Remainders that signify historical events, but themselves are nothing but signifiers. Such signifiers are the main instruments using which Elden Ring presents us its history, not through depicting it, but through leaving its marks dormant throughout the lands between, waiting to be stumbled upon by one such wanderer. As such, Elden Ring might not merely resemble human history through mirroring its general direction, the nature of its conflict or specific figures and events, but most importantly, it resembles the contemporary experience of relating to history itself. The experience of living in an age that seems to not have a proper name and is not necessarily dominated by any central idea or conflict, but is instead shattered between countless representations of all the ideas and conflicts that have existed throughout history. Ideas which, although are now more accessible than ever to all of us, remain dormant until stumbled upon. Naturally, each of us stumbles upon different bits and pieces, bearing our own shards while remaining oblivious or even at conflict to the rest leading to an estate of affairs in which the causal chain of progressive history is seemingly shattered, with various epochs existing in parallel to each other rather than leading to one another. Alas, 
Just as in the lands between, all the epochs are seemingly present at once, but only in name. For the contemporary individual, the experience of history is one of exploration and discovery, but merely among the ruins of the past. All that can be discovered from any given epoch is merely its signifiers, its decaying remains, its records, its enthusiasts, their attempts at imitating or interpreting it, and so on. The burial grounds are vast and the runes are plentiful, perhaps making it more appealing to wander through them for ideas to pillage than to come up with anything new. But in contrast to how we might indulge in whatever remains and shards we find, it is only the romantic aesthetic of Rune, so beautifully given a new life in Soulsborns, that truly does them justice, as Mia signifies that although could signify a lost glamour, simultaneously articulate the fact that it was indeed lost. Remainders and Runes of a greater whole resembling its greatness through metonymy, but simultaneously lacking it. Nonetheless, just as many of us still indulge in our little shards and get lost in dreamy idealizations of various cherry-picked episodes of history, so do many of the characters we meet in Soulsborns, leading to a decentralized, polyphonic landscape, resembling a problem play where the world is shattered in a constant dispute between representatives of various epochs, a dispute that seems to have been grinding towards a stalemate. It is as if Soulsborns depict a world where the postmodernist project has already thoroughly succeeded, having dethroned the old lords and principles but allowing no replacements. A decentralization of history that provides a platform for all of history to be given a new chance for deliberation. In Soulsborns, it is such a decentralization that constitutes the state of the world as we play. A point in history which, in Dark Souls for example, can neither be called the Age of Fire nor that of Dark, or for Dark Souls 3, a state where the Dark is still sealed away by the flame, but remains a constant threat as the Lords of Cinder refuse to reclaim their thrones. And indeed, among the ruins of the shattered worlds of Soulsborns, it is always the nameless romantic wanderer who is truly the Kingmaker. But the role of this kingmaker is best articulated in Elden Ring, where unlike the first Dark Souls, the choice is no more merely between two opposing forces. It is not merely whether to uphold the old order or to begin anew, as even those who choose to repair and perpetuate the lost, centralized order of the world are bound to disintegrate as they are faced with several contending choices. In a stark contrast to the first Dark Souls with its total of two endings, among the six different endings that Elden Ring presents to the player, four of them are devoted to various ways of restoring the Elden Ring to power, through literally modifying the ideological principles of the Golden Order. An abundance in contending ideological deviations and interpretations that not only further emphasizes the decentralized state of the lands between, but also illuminates the philosophical and linguistic nature of its disputes. In fact, even the fundamental principles of the Golden Order are presented to us as linguistic functions. In the world of Elden Ring, the Golden Order is interpreted by the fundamentalists in terms of the contrasting powers of regression and causality. Regression is defined as the tendency of all meaning towards converging into a unified state, while the structural relations between multitudes of meanings and how they are linked to each other is termed causality. Considering the definitions that Elden Ring provides us for these two concepts, it is by no means difficult to imagine their dichotomy to be mirroring that of metaphor and metonymy in the structuralism, with the latter being the way that signifiers relate and lead to one another, linking them in the chain of signification, while the former allows for one signifier to entirely replace another leading to the convergence of their meanings. Such an interpretation of the Golden Order already reinforces our earlier reiteration of the lands between as a graveyard of signifiers, but deliberating the specific naming of these two principles will even further illuminate the philosophical nature of the Golden Order. If we are to conceptualize a relationship between metonymy and causality, 
we could consider metonymy to allow for the conception of causality through making it possible for one signifier to lead to another while both remain distinct from each other. A distinction that is necessary for any causal relationship to be articulated. In Elden Ring, such interconnection of rationality and language is also articulated in the description of the Law of Causality spell, an interconnection that is a prominent theme in both structuralism and post-structuralism, with one example being Jacques Lacan's symbolic order, which, as one of the main aspects of human subjectivity, is not only responsible for the emergence of the subject of a speech, but also any notion of law and order, including rationality and causality. However, for convergence to be termed regression and posed as a force distinct from causality implies that any movement towards a more unified state is necessarily a movement backwards. Such an implication also conveniently lines up with Lacan's imaginary order, which in contrast to how the symbolic defines the subject in relation to the other, gives rise to fantasies of returning to a state of unity, an illusory state of wholeness that is assumed by the subject to have been preceding the division of the world into countless signifiers during the emergence of the symbolic order. However, such a unified state would precede the emergence of the subject too, making it resemble some form of a primordial wholeness similar to the Von Great, an entity who, in Elden Ring, gave birth to all things that exist in the world through itself getting fractured and divided. Alas, similarities between the lore of Elden Ring and the ideas of Lacan are many and already investigated by others, but what is important to us concerning the way in which Elden Ring presents its history is the fact that the Golden Order is depicted as a set of statements already contradicted by what we uncovered earlier regarding the lands between its post-historic and parallelistic state. If the law of causality is that of the natural course of history in which various signifiers, ideas or epochs are supposed to sequentially lead to one another, in the lands between they instead exist in parallel and in conflict with each other. While the law of regression argues for signifiers to move towards convergence, in the lands between they are prevented from doing so thanks to being engulfed in a deadlock that cannot be broken by any single one of them. A deadlock which, although at first might seem like a chaotic state of stagnation, is the perfect stage for the re-emergence of the Romantic Wanderer, the post-historic player who, as all of history seemingly comes back from the dead to be judged, will be there to judge their shattered remains as the decaying ruins that they are, rather than merely the lost glamour they might signify. Nonetheless, in previous Soulsborns, this wanderer usually had to make a choice among the contenders opposing each other within this stalemate. In Elden Ring, however, one might be able to choose all at once while choosing none. Soulsborns have always presented such nameless wanderers as the ultimate kingmakers, perhaps thanks to the romanticism that allows them to unify and accept all the epochs through the aesthetic of Rune, while simultaneously staying detached from any single one of them through acknowledging that they are but runes. But in Elden Ring, this romanticism itself, this all-encompassing knight, can be chosen to reunite the shattered world without venerating or stepping on any single one of its shards. While use of 19th century romantic imagery such as the full moon, medieval runes or vast seas are nothing new in Soulsborne, it is only in Elden Ring that this aesthetic viewpoint itself, which also entails its specific attitudes towards the world, is presented to us as a possible direction for it. The ending called The Age of the Stars is by no means a choice made among the contenders of this stalemate or one that attempts to return the course of history to its previous order by crowning another signifier, idea or order as the center of the world, but one that celebrates the very parallelism of the post-historic age. Age of the Stars is the only ending in Elden Ring which truly leaves the lands between on its own, not only through keeping it safe from the hands of the greater will, 
but most importantly, through introducing into the world an age of uncertainty that itself has a finite life, alongside an order that, in a stark contrast to all the variations of the Golden Order, neither seeks to rule nor claims to be eternal, but exists merely to prevent any one order from eternally ruling upon all. As such, it not only puts matters onto the hands of those who live in the lands between, but also allows them to determine the direction of their world according to their own will, by granting them the privilege of a decentralized uncertain present that leads to an uncertain future. After all, it could not be called a lonely voyage into doubt and darkness if it did not lead to yet another uncertain age. Naturally, such a voyage, embellished with so many romantic themes, can only fall upon the shoulders of the romantic wanderer. In a way, Rani's order is itself one that both perpetuates and celebrates the lack of any centralized order, all the while bearing the most romantic symbol of all, the full moon that, in our own history, was once venerated as a way to rebel against the eternal golden order of the Enlightenment is once again presented to us in an entirely new form, as a way to unify and revive a shattered world that is now but a graveyard of the past. In an age when all of history is seemingly present at once, only the chill night that encompasses all can truly accept and succeed all, allowing for all of the stars to shine at once, a night which itself shall be succeeded by a new day. This is the new romanticism that Elden Ring presents to us, the wanderers, as a path to a new age, stretching into darkness with all its fear, doubt and loneliness. I do solemnly swear to every living being and every living soul. Now cometh the age of the stars, a thousand year voyage under the wisdom of the moon. Here beginneth the chill night that encompasses all, reaching the great beyond. into fear, doubt, and loneliness, as the path stretches into darkness. <laughs> 